Good morning. We have a fantastic panel here for you, as you can see, on financing health for all in the context of scarcity. Now, if you've listened to State Secretary Annan's um, keynote, or if you've been here yesterday evening, you are already aware of many of the key issues that are on the table. If you weren't here, I'll give you just the 20-second recap, which is we are coming out of this global pandemic and the economic crises that followed from it, which have made us all acutely aware just how vulnerable our health systems are and how underfunded. And this wasn't a singular experience of some countries. This happened to literally everyone. So we need to do something differently. How can we get financing health for all, not the few, right this time, especially in this current and seemingly ever-present context of scarcity, which means some say there isn't enough money to go around, or is there? So these are the questions we put to a catalyst dialogue convened by the Health Hub and Healthy Developments. So what is a catalyst dialogue? We brought together five distinguished representatives from academia, um, development corporation, foundations, and the private sector. The five came together for a virtual debate as well as a series of interviews. Their central thoughts, they were bursting with ideas, were captured in this policy brief that Christina just mentioned. So the objective was to collect ideas and inspiration to feed that into the German policy space and to discuss that with decision makers who are here today and this is what we are doing now. Um, so we are bringing together two of our Catalyst Dialogue participants, Jayati and Christoph, together with two distinguished gentlemen from um, the German government, uh, Björn and Wolfram. So let me briefly introduce our panelists. So we have Professor Dr. Jayati Ghosh, who joins us virtually. She's a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is also, among many other important roles, a member of the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. So if you're not aware of this, this is sort of your all-star, all-female group of 10 economists, area experts, that was convened by the WHO Director General to rethink how value in health and well-being is measured, produced, and distributed. Tiny little task there, which they have mastered absolutely wonderfully. Um, we took one of the highly influential briefs that Jayati and her colleagues produced as the starting point and inspiration for this Catalyst Dialogue. Next to me, uh, we have Dr. Christoph Benn, who many of you know. He's currently the Director of Global Health Diplomacy at the Jörg Lange Institute, and Christoph is also a founding member and former um, Director of External Relations of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Björn Kümmel, on the far end, is the Deputy Head of Division for Global Health at the German Federal Ministry of Health, and Björn has also worked extensively with the WHO in all relevant government bodies, governing bodies, and has served as Vice Chair of the WHO Executive Board. And finally, we have Dr. Wolfram Morgenroth-Klein, Head of Division for Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and One Health at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, he has served at BMZ for over 20 years in various positions, including as the head of the vision for fundamental principles. That sounds quite philosophical. Uh, so let's, let's see what we get. Um, so heads up on the audience interaction. So you obviously here in the room and online are also really important participants in this dialogue. And we have plenty of time um, for audience interaction in the second half of this session. Um, I understand, Jayati, you have only limited time. So um, if you need to jump off at some point, uh, please do. But we will take uh, as much of, of your thoughts um, right now also in the beginning. So let's get started. And Jayati, I I'd love to, to start with you. Um, with all this pandemic trouble behind us um, and the compounding crises we have been through or that we're still in, this could be a great moment to fundamentally rethink how we value health, um, how we finance health for all. Dr. Tedros called the ideas that you put forth with the council, and I love this, he called them radical and welcome 
because they're built on the premise that physical and mental well-being should be a central goal of economies and not just a stepping stone to other objectives. So this sounds great, but why haven't we done this yet? Or how can we achieve that paradigm shift from health financing as an investment rather than a cost? Jayati. Well, thank you so much. And first of all, let me say that I was very happy to be part of this Catalyst Dialogue because in the WHO Council, which uh, Mariana Matsukapu heard yesterday, I believe, was the chair of, our purpose was precisely that, to actually get involved in policy making, to persuade people who are in a position to make a difference, to actually take on some of these ideas. And we begin with, yes, a paradigm shift. We say that, look, economies should be for people and for the planet and for societies. It's not the other way around. You have to think of economic policies and of how economic markets and, and processes function, not in terms of them being the goal, but in terms of them being the way in which we reach our social and planetary goals. So if one of our goals is health for all, which I think obviously it's a no brainer, we really should have it. If it is a just equitable society, if it is a society that lives within planetary boundaries, let's think of the economy that gets us there. Let's not think of each thing in terms of how it contributes to the economy. Let's think of the economy as contributing to our social goals. And that in turn requires a fundamental rethinking of what we term economic policy and the importance of what I would call a whole of government approach. That is, the health ministry should not be the only one concerned about health. You have to have ministers of finance for sure, but you also have to have ministers of technology, science and technology. You have to have ministers for the environment. You have to have energy ministers, everybody involved because all of these things impact health. And so in this whole of government approach, the issue is not of financing particular health initiatives or uh, activities. It's not just certain curative practices or even a certain preventive practice like funding a vaccine or something. It's really looking at the totality of things that only governments can do. And let's face it, there's a lot of that, right? The reason we need public spending or we need public subsidies is because markets don't deliver a lot of these things. So we look at that totality of things. In my own country, India, for example, controlling pollution is absolutely critical to health. We have the largest levels of atmospheric pollution in the world, and our industries are contributing, our other economic activities like construction are contributing. The way we are organizing our economy is doing that, and it's also contributing to global warming, right? So we have to be thinking about how we actually handle investments there, how we incentivize certain incentives versus others. So global public investment, which is something that has come up in your policy paper, I'm very glad to see, is the idea that there are public goods out there, there are a whole range of public goods and public bads that need state intervention of some kind. And these are no longer national, these are fundamentally global. And therefore you have to be thinking of global ways of dealing with it, of global ways of financing it. Global financing of these goods is based on a notion of global public investment, which is very different from foreign aid, which is very different from a kind of, you know, let's be nice to the poor countries, let's be good and deliver some external assistance. No, it is recognizing that these are global problems. We need to have global investment. And so every country pays in according to ability and the world decides how and where it should go and what kinds of investment are the most urgent and critical. It's obvious how this works for climate change. I would argue it works as much for PPPR as you have just mentioned. Now, to ensure these, there's a whole range of ways in which we have to finance this. And your um, state secretary just mentioned a number of these ways, but there's no doubt that you can't do this without major public resources. Whether you are going to de-risk the private or subsidize and underwrite private investment, or you are going to go out there and spend the money yourselves, you have to have the public resources to do that. And therefore, newer innovative means of taxation or just cleaning up the act of global taxation, if you like, is essential. And this is something that I have been uh, very concerned about in another commission that I'm a part of, it's the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, 
uh, chaired by Joseph Stiglitz and myself, we are looking at the enabling environment for taxation. And you know, and ultimately right now, internationally, the taxation system was developed a century ago. The legal rules, the, the criteria for taxation, cross-border especially, uh, they're completely out of date. They're no longer relevant. They cannot be applicable anymore because they were developed in a time when you didn't have digital services. You certainly didn't have major multinational corporations with you know offices in almost uh, every country you didn't have the ability of very rich individuals to stash their wealth in tax havens we now have to develop a global system that enables you enables governments to tax all of these elements and therefore we have to think about the current tax treaties we have to think of the bilateral investment treaties and how they're preventing these things but most of all we have to think of for example, a proper minimum corporate tax rate that would be an average of the global rate. At ICRIC, we have suggested 25%, even 21%, as suggested originally by Janet Yellen, would be fine. You have to think about taxing all the profits of multinationals, not allowing them to shift their profits to low tax jurisdictions. And one way of doing that is to look at their global profits and allocate those global profits across countries depending on let's say their share of sales and employment, okay? So basically you have to think that a company will not have any incentive to shift its profits to let's say the Cayman Islands or Ireland or some low tax jurisdiction because it will be taxed on its revenues and employment in particular countries anyway, depending on what it's actually getting out of that jurisdiction. This is a very simple low hanging fruit. It's not difficult. Uh, the international agreement that we've had so far hasn't been satisfactory. There has been a lot of lobbying by multinationals, which has prevented, shall we say, more effective action. But this is now a discussion that has moved to the United Nations. There is talk of a global tax convention. And this is something that Germany, for example, could play an extremely positive role in. Now, remember, in fact, everybody gains. People in the whole world gain and uh, governments gain. And it's only multinational corporations who, let's face it, are making super profits without sharing those, who will not gain. I mean, really there is no reason why we cannot push forward with this because it is in the interests of people everywhere and it's in the interests of governments everywhere. We've also talked about debt resolution in the policy paper. We had long discussions on that and I'm really glad to see that that's there. We, uh, there are about 72 countries now facing immediate severe debt distress or on the brink of it. There are about 11 countries in actual default. There are some in implicit default. But all of these countries, and there are many countries who are still paying more in debt service than they are paying for health, for example. You have to do something about this global debt problem. And unfortunately, the same kinds of leeway that we allow, let's say, private debtors or individual debtors household debt, as we don't allow them for sovereign debt. We have to have a system of sovereign debt restructuring that has to be rapid, flexible, responsive, deal with the crises. It, very recently, Pakistan had major floods, absolutely climate related, we know that, in which they lost about $26 billion in terms of damage, infrastructure damage and, and so on. They are at the moment struggling to get $4 billion out of the IMF stretched over a period of three years. They are not getting debt relief. They have no other access to any foreign exchange reserves. Their foreign exchange reserves are down to one month's worth of imports. This is ridiculous, right? We really have to actually have much more speedy implementation of some kinds of debt management. And it has to involve all creditors not just bilateral creditors like China, the new ones, but also the international financial institutions who must be able to have prolonged rescheduling. If they're not doing an absolute debt cut down, a haircut on themselves, they must at least do major rescheduling. Once again, Germany can play a very important role. Similarly, SDRs, special drawing rights of the IMF, this is low hanging fruit. It is almost virtually costless because you only pay the interest rate on the SDR, which is less than 1% at the moment. A new issue of SDRs would clearly pave the way for significant easing of the major stress facing low-income countries, debtor countries, and so on. 
But even the SDRs that were received in 2021, 650 billion were uh, issued, 400 billion of that went to you know, the rich countries, basically, who are never going to use that. Germany, for example, not going to use it. Recycle those SDRs. There are systems, the IMF set up uh, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, but there are many other systems. You could recycle them to re uh, regional development banks. You could do many other ways in which you could actually simply take the SDRs that you're never going to use and make it available to countries in extreme distress. Again, it needs one big country to set the way. And that will already, I think, act as a very positive uh, way of influencing other countries to follow suit. So, you know, there's so much that, that um, Germany could do in that respect immediately. And uh, public-private partnerships were mentioned, I think, just now also by your state secretary. They are definitely going to play a big role. There's no way getting away from it. You obviously need private investments in health. You obviously need private investments to deal with the climate challenge. Uh, but the trouble with a lot of the current strategies for de-risking or for encouraging, incentivizing, and so on, is that they don't provide conditions to make sure that these actually are along with social goals and meet the basic principles of equity and justice and fairness. So, for example, we've had during the pandemic huge subsidies being given to major pharmaceutical companies to develop vaccines against COVID-19. And yet, after that, they're given a free pass. They can charge what they like, including to the same governments that subsidize them. They can keep hold of that intellectual property, giving them an effective monopoly over that, and thereby reduce the amount of supply, and thereby prevent other producers from coming up. And this was a major reason why we could not vaccinate the entire world as quickly as we could have otherwise. This is a major reason why, let me put it very frankly, there is such distrust in the global majority towards G7 countries, because it has been a moral failure. It's not just the vaccine grabbing, which let's face it was obscene. It is the fact that the intellectual property rights for these publicly subsidized ways of dealing with the disease were allowed to be kept in private corporate control in corporations based in the North. And they, the technologies that would enable countries to deal with this were denied to other developing countries. And attempts like the mRNA hub, which is a wonderful attempt uh, to actually develop their own technologies are being constantly uh, uh, con uh, constrained by intellectual property demands by Moderna, for example, which is actually fi still fighting cases against the mRNA hub on the grounds that they have been appropriating some of their patented knowledge. This is something that we really have to address. We will never be able to deal with our global challenges in climate or health or in anything else, really, any of the major public bads that we are going to be facing if we do not address what I consider to be an absolutely obscene privatization of knowledge. Again, this is something that if Germany leads the way, many, many other countries can follow. I think there's a huge potential there. And it's also something, let, let me be quite honest, it's something we need if we're going to get anything like global solidarity, there is a huge lack of trust right now in the world. And somehow we have to stop this polarization. We have to bring ourselves back into a way in which we can address global challenges together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jayati. So if you have no time to read the paper Jayati just gave you, I think, the fantastic synopsis with hitting on all the key points. And I want to come back to, to, sub, to most of these uh, one by one. Um, Bjorn, Jayati mentioned um, kind of this having to be a global and an international effort. So from your experience working with WHO, working in fora like the G7 and the G20, um, what does it take to... to with trust, to build that trust, to work with others and to convince others, but also ourselves, that health is an investment and not a cost. Okay, um, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I just realized that uh, I guess I know every second person in the room. It seems um, like a family reunion to some extent. Um, lots of colleagues uh, from the global health arena obviously here. So um, with regards to the question, um, I've been working in the health ministry now for 15 years, roughly, on European and international um, 
uh, topics, and obviously one topic was always high on the agenda and remains to be high on the agenda, which is investments in health and how do we advocate in favor um, of investments uh, for health. Obviously, uh, Germany is a key uh, example for doing so because we um, have potentially the, the oldest social health insurance system and many of the other countries are looking um, at our experience, what went well, what didn't went well, how much we are investing and um, compared to many of the other countries, we are obviously investing uh, a lot in our um, domestic health um, system. But that is not to say that uh, we shouldn't advocate for others to do so. Obviously, this is a very important year when it comes to um, global investments and global calls to invest um, stronger in, in health systems. We have the UN high-level meetings coming up. Um, State Secretary Annen mentioned that. Uh, one key, obviously, is the universal health coverage um, high-level meeting, and I'm sure um, Wolfram is going to touch upon that uh, in, a, in a second, too. And obviously, we need this um, highest level political leadership um, to uh, call for stronger investments. But is this, that sufficient? And my, my answer would be no, certainly not. Um, I think that it's naive to believe that um, a UN meeting in New York, where we uh, adopt uh, um, a non-binding resolution uh, or by 194 member states, is sufficient. Yeah? It certainly is not sufficient. This is not the first UN high-level meeting on UHC that will call for stronger investments in, in health systems. And there will, I'm sure there will be future ones calling for the same thing. What is needed is a strong call from, from societies and, and from domestic um, people in the end. Um, I do not share the notion that um, health, is primarily, um, health is primarily a global responsibility. I think to a vast majority it's a domestic responsibility and we need to um, hold, uh, well, governments, um, national domestic governments to account for what they invest in health and whether they understand that health is a political and financial choice every one of us has to take or whether they are not doing so. So primarily I think the responsibility rests upon domestic shoulders and obviously there is also a, a global responsibility um, on, on, on many of the global public goods. but. I wouldn't dilute both. Um, I I, I, it's hard to say that in percentage terms, but from my point of view, from my feeling, the vast majority obviously needs to come through domestic finances, from, through domestic um, uh, commitments. And I think also in that regard, um, State Secretary Annen mentioned that the German government um, does a lot to advocate for um, stronger investments. Um, also in other countries, there are great um, initiatives like P4H, Providing for Health, which is linked to the World Bank and, and, uh, and WHO, uh, great programs where, where we are doing our utmost in order to boost further investments. But I think um, that domestic constituencies need to hold their governments to account for what they are doing or what they are not doing. Um, thank you for raising that, which I want to take up with you, Wolfram. Before I do that, um, if you have burning questions, even if you're here in the room, and definitely when you're online, you can post them in the chat. Even if you're in the room, you know, you don't want to forget your question, go to slido.com with the hashtag GHT2023, and you can post the questions there, and we'll take them um, after the fact. So, um, Wolfram, uh, Björn just said it. So, providing and financing health for all is ultimately a domestic responsibility, the responsibility of societies, of governments, and their budgets. So how can countries increase domestic financing for health? And does Germany have a plan to support other countries in doing so? Yes, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I would, I would completely agree that the, the vast majority of, of funding has to come from um, domestic efforts, uh, which means uh, government efforts and of course also uh, taking into account all what private persons can, can contribute because it's in their own interest to keep healthy. Um, even though um, um, in the end uh, we must uh, look uh, at, at, at rationally at, uh, at the funding gaps that still will persist and, um, and, and, and you look at the, at the international estimates um, it's, it's in between 10 and 14 billion per year uh, on pandemic uh, preparedness, um, uh, which, which still would be missing. And you, if you look at uh, universal health coverage, it would be uh, more than 50 billion per year. 
you would need in order to fund that uh, and, and, and pro probably will not find uh, low and middle income countries even if they in increase their spending to, to, to cover all of this um, so, soon enough. So there is a, is a high need and I think a, a, common, a common feeling that um, on the international level uh, the efforts also have to uh, increase. Um, so, but how, how, can, how can we uh, do that? And I, I think uh, let let us imagine that we that we have to to convince our our budgetary committees in the parliament uh, on this. And um, even I must confess, even if we say it's an investment, it's not a cost. They will say, but still, it is our, our taxpayers' money we have to spend here. So, better be good at putting good arguments forward. And I think that that. In, in my view, is the main thing. We have to, um, to, to give good arguments that the return on investment is high, and it is high indeed. It is more than uh, nine, or depending on, 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 on which study you look at, uh, more than 20 times um, the, the cost you put in. Um, the, the, the return is especially high for preventive uh, measures. It is not uh, uh, mainly, uh, the thing we should look at is, is, is the, 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 the vaccines or the treatment of uh, ill people. It is um, um, having societies as healthy, healthy as, as possible from the beginning on, which is the um, most cost-effective solution. I think that is uh, one part of the set of arguments for the return on investment, but the other part is, of course, to show that um, the money governments and or governments together with the private sector spent is well spent money. So we are in a high pressure to, to show uh, good results with everything we do in our international funding, with everything we do in our bilateral funding, and also, of course, in the international funding. Um, yeah, and, and some of the aspects, of course, have been mentioned already. The mobilization of resources uh, by the international financial institutions is something we consider as especially important from our ministry side. So we are participating very actively in the discussion on how to reform World Bank spending on um, global uh, public goods in general, on how to also um, shift from an understanding that defines emergencies only as uh, financial emergencies or uh, national, uh, natural catastrophes, um, but also as something as a health catastrophe which we just went through with COVID-19. Um, and I completely agree that this is not only um, to be applied to, to the World Bank, but to all development banks and also to, to the IMF, and I think GRT has put it uh, very, very clearly that also um, the instruments of the of the International Monetary Fund have to be reviewed in such such way to to, to broaden um, the perspective of of, of what uh, crises um, are and 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 how to and in which situations to use uh, special drawing rights. Um, Yes, and the last point, perhaps in, in order not to be too long, the mobilization of, of funds, of funding from the private sector is, is something which is absolutely necessary. Um, it is uh, not easy in such a way that uh, on the one side we as German government, um, we know that, um, that intellectual property rights um, are a very sensitive and touchy issue, but they are necessary. Um, we would look at flexibilizing them in such a way that um, they will not be a hindrance to a, a very high production of vaccines. So, to, uh, just to, put, to stick with that example, um, in, in, in case of, of a very high uh, demand for it, um, but um, uh, they are still necessary in order to, to give in incentives for, for innovation and for science, on the other hand. So, so th there is a difficult balance, I think, we, we need to, to observe here. And of course, it's not only um, about uh, um, um, giving incentives to the private sector to participate, also regulating it, of course, and, and, and sometimes uh, also moderating it, uh, moderating between the demands uh, of and the needs from societies, from, from, from uh, the international um, community and, and, um, and the private sector, which only will um, invest if the, the, the picture is clear and if, um, if there is a long-term perspective for their, for their investments. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the private sector in, in just a second. Before we do that, Christoph, staying on the issue of 
increasing domestic resources to invest in health. Jayati mentioned it, I, I, and I want to come back to her in a second. Um, it's difficult for countries to invest in health for all if they're overburdened with debt. And uh, Jayati mentioned these figures. I think in 2020, 37 low and lower middle income countries spent more on debt service than they spent on health. Um, so can debt restructuring be part of that solution? And why isn't that happening yet? Thanks, Clemens. And um, it seems we have already one agreement here that uh, most of the funding for financing universal health coverage should come from domestic funding, that it requires a proper tax base. And I think Germany indeed can help, you know, arguing for that. It requires a lot of political will, first of all. Um, and uh, the other thing that we recommended in our paper was also that Germany can support civil society in those countries where civil society can hold governments to account to spend enough resources on their domestic health budgets. However, now we come to the challenge. You know, you can, of course, ask governments to increase their health spending, but if they are in a situation of debt distress, it's, it's almost unfair to say, yes, you should increase your budget, but first of all, service our debt. And we also have a question here on the screen from the audience uh, in that direction. So, this is an absolutely critical issue that we have to address. We cannot discuss increasing domestic health financing without addressing, you know, debt distress that, that many countries, particularly in Africa, are in. Now, there are, in my view, two different aspects of that. You can restructure debt, and that often happens under the Paris Club and other international agreements, and Germany is an important player in that. And that is important, but we also know there are challenges because a lot of the debt these days in these countries is held by China or held by the private sector, where Germany has only limited influence, let's say, on that kind of debt restructuring. So, I feel we have to look also more at what can Germany do, what, what's in the kind of sphere of influence of Germany. You can, of course, bilaterally also, you know, uh, reduce or cancel debt, um, and I would very much welcome that. But you can imagine I was uh, thrilled to hear this morning State Secretary Annen praising the debt to health scheme um, that Germany is implementing through the Global Fund as an innovative scheme in this regard. And it has a couple of advantages, because if you just cancel debt in general, yes, you increase the fiscal space and the governments can use that for whatever they choose. Uh, debt swaps, on the other hand, for health have the advantage that the debt is, you know, cancelled, but it is then conditional about investments in health. So it is a much more direct link to what we are discussing here, reduce the debt burden and invest that money in health. And in my experience, it has helped a number of countries then with that kind of fiscal space investing directly from the Ministry of Finance, giving that money to the Ministry of Health. So I would applaud the German government for, you know, having um, implemented that. I understand, well, from you have a budget line for debt swaps uh, for that. And um, my recommendation would be, and I think that meets the recommendation from the group, might be to explore that further. Um, I know there is a certain administrative burden on that uh, that needs to be met. However, there is this innovative aspect that I think we need to use and use more in terms of debt swaps for health because that can really, in many instances, provide additional resources, much needed resources that are basically domestic resources set free by the debt swaps. In addition to uh, debt swaps, um, Jayati, you mentioned already earlier the potential role of um, taxation systems to, to increase countries' resources for health. And so international corporate taxation comes to mind. I think in March this year, you wrote a letter together with your co-chair, Joseph Stieglitz, to the UN Secretary General, as one does, I suppose, in March, um, to say the international taxation system isn't very effective in letting countries raise the revenue they need in order to invest in health for all. So how can we help countries increase domestic uh, resources for health? Uh, and what role do these taxation systems play and how can we get there realistically? Yes, so you know, like, like the rest of the panel, I completely agree that most of the resources for health have to come from domestic governments. And, and they have to come not just in health spending, but in a whole range of other related spending on infrastructure, and energy, environment, and so on. Uh, how do you raise that money? Well, yes, there are the countries in debt distress, and you definitely need to do that. Uh, there is the 
uh, easily available option of SDRs and recycling of SDRs, where I do believe Germany, frankly, can do a lot more than it's doing at the moment in terms of just making available the, the SDRs. It's never going to use itself. But there is also the fact that currently governments are finding it hard to raise money simply because of the way the global tax rules are formulated. So we have to actually address those. At the moment, every multinational corporation can claim that it's a different company in every country that it operates. And you can only tax whatever it claims to be its profits in that country. Now, in fact, that we know that's not true. We know that Apple has is one company with one set of shareholders. We know that Amazon is one company and so on, right? On the other hand, we in Germany, you can, tra you can tax Apple Germany, depending on what they claim their profits are, having transferred a significant amount of that to, let us say, Ireland within Europe or some other country, which is a relative tax haven. We are saying, no, you should be able to tax your share of the global profits whether it is Germany or India or uh, Ghana or any country, must be able to tax their share of the global profits of a multinational, depending on some criteria like, for example, uh, whether it's a natural resource extracting uh, activity, which in which case, therefore, they're benefiting from the fact that you have that natural resource, or the sales in that country, or the employment, because a lot of production occurs in that country. So a formula that would actually distribute the global profits and allow each country to tax them the same way it would tax a domestic company. All it's doing is saying that a multinational corporation should be paying the same tax as a domestic corporation. That's not too much to ask. And yet that, if it were properly done, we estimate would yield very significant amounts of revenue, around 250 billion altogether globally. A minimum tax rate would further add to that because it would enable you, if countries do not wish to do that, to say, well, you know, your global income, whatever you're earning, we are going to make sure that you're paying at least that minimum tax. We will tax you that difference in our own jurisdiction. The United States already does that with guilty, but it's possible for other countries to do that as well. Wealth tax, it's another thing where, you know, we have had obscene concentration of wealth in the last few years in particular. The top 1%, it's not just that they have grown dramatically in assets, but they're also responsible for, you know, 17% of global warming. So let's actually tax the extreme wealthy. For that, you need to have national asset registers that trace the beneficial owners. Let's find out who are the beneficial owners. It's not some random trust set in the Cayman Islands or in Panama. There, have, there are people behind that. So force all the trusts to reveal the beneficial owners. Create these registers and share the information across just tax jurisdictions. The OECD actually has said that this should happen. It is taking very long and most developing countries are left out of it. But that way, in fact, the rich countries and their institutions would not be such enablers of the illicit financial flows that we're seeing out of Africa and out of so much of the developing world. Um, I, I'd like to, us to look at the flip side of sort of taxation of international corporations, Bjorn, which is um, sort of private investment as a potential source of um, financing of investment in health. Um, so how can more private investments for health be leveraged both internationally and in partner countries? And, and what are the challenges there? Okay, Clemens, I think with regard to the second part of the question, we have to address this to, to Wolfram because I'm not in charge of um, partnering countries uh, coming from the health ministry. So my, oh, I, I have no real expertise in that. Um, my expertise is rather in the global uh, coordination, global mechanisms, WHO, etc. And obviously also there uh, the question uh, is often coming up whether private funding could be uh, boosting um, the finances of WHO, for example. And there are lots of interesting notions around there um, how international organizations are driven by individual private entities. Um, and I think it's important to, to have a proper look at this, obviously. Um, in the WHO um, arena, uh, there, is, there are two different tracks. On the one hand, there is this overall um, idea or notion to obviously ensure the integrity of, of WHO and um, no conflict of interest and uh, not having private entities taking over 
uh, an international organization that needs to be driven by member states and which is driven by member states. And I think I don't share that, that, uh, that notion. And on the other hand, uh, whenever it comes to financing, there is a strong call also among member states to say, well, since we um, face uh, scarce resources, let's look at the private sector and let's have the private sector taking over. And I think to some extent, um, the same thing happens um, in the domestic sphere. I think from my point of view, obviously the private sector can play a crucial and important role, but conflict of interest needs to be adequately handled, um, which is the case in WHO, um, just to get this right in, in order not to um, produce further conspiracy um, theories. In WHO, there is obviously one key um, private entity that um, is, is a strong financial supporter, but for good reasons, um, and, and I think that we are to a large extent um, glad that um, that private entity uh, is a strong supporter of the WHO and primarily of one specific pillar, which is a special program, polio eradication. And if polio is once uh, eradicated, hopefully sooner than later in the near future, then it's also due to that strong commitment um, and investment of that private entity. Um, to a large extent, WHO is financed through um, or to the vast majority, WHO is financed through member states and to some extent also other international organizations like Gavi, Global Fund and others and, and the European Union. So I think there are those two points. I think it's important to um, count on the private sector and investments and incentivizing obviously their investments in health, but on the other hand, um, acknowledging uh, conflicts of interest and not seeing them as the magic bullet and certainly not seeing them as diluting the responsibility of governments, domestic governments. Maybe one additional point to the question that you raised before, um, in, or a point that I, I raised with regards to the highest level political leadership that we need. Um, to me, obviously that's needed and, and we need to use this political momentum um, in the UN high level meetings um, as much as we can. And I think it's, it's for many constituencies, it's a game changer if their president is there and commits to universal health coverage and that needs to be used. In the German setting, obviously, uh, there's a strong player that you always need to involve and, and also State Secretary Annen was referring to it and actually left because of that, which is the parliament. Yeah? And I think also there much can be learned from the German um, experience. We have a strong parliament, well, we have a very strong parliament and we we as, as representatives of the government can feel that every day um, and in a positive and sometimes also in a, in a difficult setting when it comes to resources, but the parliament needs to understand and, and needs to be fully committed to making health an investment. Um, and I, I'm sure that that will also be true for many others. It's a good, um, it's a good um, dynamics that more and more parliaments um, focus on global health. We have in the German parliament a subcommittee which uh, is focusing on global health, and we understand that also other, um, uh, in other countries there are subcommittees and, and committees being founded uh, looking especially, especially on global health issues and also on the investment in health. By the way, uh, yesterday evening Tina Rudolph uh, was here as one of the members of parliament engaged here, and she said she's always looking forward to, for example, the policy briefs that come out of, of this global um, health hub and of the discussions that are happening here. So it's great, I think, to hear that we're not communicating into the void, but it's actually falling on fertile ground in this, as you're saying. Parliament has a strong actor in this. And just by the way, tomorrow um, I will have the pleasure, together with my state secretary, to address the finance committee explaining why we invest in global structures um, in health. So the, the health ministry, which obviously um, we, we do that with pleasure, but it's also a difficult discussion these days with scarce resources. Fantastic. Um, I want to give you a heads up. So I have one more question each for Wolfram and Christoph, and then it's over to you, um, both online and in the room. So if you have your question, get it ready. There will be people with microphones. So we use the remaining then 15 minutes um, to discuss with you all. Um, Wolfram, so uh, Björn already turned the question over to you regarding uh, private sector investment also in partner countries. And obviously your ministry plays a role also in, in I guess, in, in encouraging and shepherding um, some of what is happening there. So how can governments and specifically the German government encourage and ensure that private sector investments in health contribute to health for all? Um, and what, what is Germany doing there? Yes, thank you. Um, 
Yes, I think the policy brief uh, launched today gives some, some useful indications and ideas on where the problems and also some of the challenges and solutions might be. Um, so I won't repeat all that that is written there, which is really useful. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think the first thing is um, uncertainty and, uh, and, and um, uh, small markets are, are the problems that are um, most problematic to, to uh, the private sector investments in health sectors in, in, in well, in general, but especially in, in our partner countries, which are developing um, lower and middle income countries. Uh, so, so there is a general notion of um, um, creating a better regulatory framework and in, in our bilateral cooperation, and not only in bilateral cooperation, also through development banks and so forth, we, we, we offer um, also um, consultancy on, on how to improve the general framework um, uh, for, for, for national and also region, re, uh, whole regions um, to, 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 um, uh, to attract more, more investment from, from private sectors. And I think the, the um, vaccination um, campaign uh, in Africa, um, State Secretary Annan has mentioned uh, that we, we are investing 500 million. Um, that is, uh, so to say, a joint um, uh, effort in order to to, to give the right incentives to, to private sector to start local production and, um, and to offer it in a good quality and hopefully also a price that is competitive. But we, we know that this is one of the, of the critical points also. They, as soon as somebody is producing in a country like Rwanda, um, um, he has to, to do so in, in, in good quality and in good prices. And um, there's a whole debate on how to incentivize um, um, also, um, those who demand um, uh, uh, to incentivize them uh, so they can pay the price difference that is to be expected for the next 10 years or so. So it's, it's, it's really a market shaping exercise with, uh, which also requires a long-term um, long effort uh, in our view. Um, second thing is the, the risk pooling and, and, and uh, common... Uh, uh, the shared pooling of, of, um, of uh, uh, um, buying um, products, medical products, which has proved as a very good, um, a very good uh, instrument in order to put uh, a, a huge number of countries in a better position towards the private, um, uh, the private offers, and also good for the private sector because they know they can they can produce large amounts and, and offer them to better prices. So, so the risk uh, pooling and the, the, the common pooling of funds as ha has happened uh, in, in, in the global fund uh, and now in the COVID-19 um, um, area, I think is something we shall also um, be considering um, as, as a tool to, 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 to um, incentivize the, the markets. Um, Yes, and last thing, um, the regulatory um, 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 framework in order to make clear to private sector that um, as soon as we put state money, as soon as we put subsidies on something, we also expect them to, um, to offer uh, things in a fair and uh, equitable way. Um, and to, to, to take care of that is something which is difficult because it depends on each situation and each um, product, um, but which is also needed in order to, to, to have the results and, and, uh, that we desire to have, of course. We don't want to, uh, to boost the private sector, we want to have results for, for people, of course. Uh, last point, which goes to the former discussion on, on debt swaps, um, uh, debt for health swaps in this case. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that our State Secretary mentioned them. Um, but I would, I would also say um, um, we will explore and we will expand this instrument as much as we can. I would only put medium hopes in, in the whole instrument because um, 
um, as Christopher said, it's, uh, it's, uh, the depths are not uh, only and not even mainly in many cases with uh, OECD, Paris Club uh, governments. Uh, they are becoming more and more depths, for example, with China, and it's very difficult to influence that. Um, also because the whole debt sustainability has to be discussed before entering um, um, a debt uh, swap model and thirdly because it always depends also on the country and their feasibility uh, for giving that to the health sector so um, we will we will uh, I would be mildly optimistic that we will be able to 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 uh, enter debt swaps in a, uh, one, two, three, four, five or something, but it will not be dozens in the next years. Thank you. So before we turn it to the audience, uh, we, we can't leave here uh, without sort of zooming out one last time to sort of the global health architecture, the global health financing architecture, which, which links to uh, Wolfram's last, last point. So the multilateral banks, but also the global health initiatives like the Global Fund, they obviously shape how and how much countries invest in health, and yet health doesn't seem to be consistently prioritized there. So Christoph, um, what, are, what would be some of the, our next big to-dos in terms of thinking about the global landscape there for financing health for all? Yeah, if you are looking at international financing of health we are used for have been used for decades to look at it through the framework of development assistance for health basically a couple of fairly rich countries giving money to a large number of poorer countries to support something like health system strengthening particular health interventions subsidizing the purchase procurement of drugs vaccines and so on. that's you know what we're used to but the countries investing through that were not expecting a direct benefit back to them it was more kind of global solidarity, which is a very, very important value. But I think that's exactly also the reason why many budget committees didn't look at it like an investment that would you know, benefit them in some way. It is like, yes, we want to be a generous country and we, we support that as solidarity. But in recent years, we've seen that many of the issues we are discussing here are not just issues of global solidarity, but they are really global public goods starting with the pandemic that we just experienced. And now what needs to happen, the State Secretary talked about the pandemic fund, about you know, how we are we investing in pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. This is a global public good that is affecting all countries. This is making the world a safer place. This is global health security. And you can argue, yes, if we invest in that, that's not just the kind of flow from the north to the south. That is something that affects all of us. And that's a different proposal also to people controlling budgets. Or look at investments now in climate and health. We know that climate change is one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge for global health over the next years to come. If we invest in that, then that is a global public good because climate change is affecting all of us. And again, will make the world a safer place. Another example would be investments in research and development, a very, very important topic. And we need to invest in that so that it can benefit also low and middle income countries. But if we invest in that, it also has, you know, of course, repercussions for, you know, um, countries like Germany uh, and not just the kind of scientific community, but because these breakthroughs in research and development like investments in vaccine research, State Secretary again mentioned mRNA vaccines and so on, that is a global benefit. But if we look at that through that framework, then it changes also who should pay for that, because then all countries should feel responsibility for these public goods. It is in everybody's interest. It is not just a few uh, donor countries that are you know, traditionally investing in that. And that's a new paradigm shift, and we mentioned that in this paper uh, that we've issued, and actually Jayati and I served um, on a global expert working group on the principles of global public investment and issued a report together and so on. And that's, uh, you know, uh, quoted in this report as the GPI principles requiring all countries to make a contribution because all will then also benefit, but also all need to be represented fairly in the governance structures of international funds and organizations and of all these initiatives financing and supporting the global public goods. And I think that is a framework we increasingly need to use. And hopefully that will also help with convincing budget committees in many different countries. Because for countries like Germany, um, it means look at that on top of the 
you know, budget, let's like, say, of the BMZ for, for development assistance for health, that we look at investments in global public goods in a separate way. These needs to be additional money. And for many other countries, it means for the first time, they need to establish a budget line for global public goods, including in health, because they haven't done that yet. But they need to establish that. So it needs to be a kind of common priority. And Germany can obviously play also an influential role in talking to other countries, other governments, and other parliaments. I was talking to parliamentarians yesterday here in Germany that they reach out to their colleagues in parliaments and other countries and arguing for that. And as we have seen, the kind of subcommittee that we have on global health um, has become a little bit of a model. Other countries are kind of trying to kind of implementing that now. And I think uh, the German uh, subcommittee can really also influence other countries, parliamentary colleagues, on this new framework for financing international health. So there is hope. That's there right. is definitely hope. Um, so before we turn it um, to the audience, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, four people that you don't see here right now. So we had three other Catalyst Dialogue participants who you didn't see on the panel, but who very much shaped um, the conversation, and I just want to mention them briefly. So, so this is Leslie Ann Long, the president and CEO of the Global Business Coalition for Health. We had also joining us Rias Tanoli, the CEO of the Social Health Protection in Initiative in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province in Pakistan, and uh, Tom Hart, a senior research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute. And lastly, but very importantly, the policy brief that you can access online and that we've heard so much about already um, was researched and written by um, Corinne Granger, um, who has done an absolutely fantastic job on this. Um, so now, let's turn it over to you. And I would um, give priority for the first question to the room, and then let's turn it to our online participants. The gentleman in the back had his hand up in lightning speed. So um, I would love to give him the first opportunity. Thank you very much. Since nobody knows me, Marvin Meyer with World Vision Germany, I think I know three of the four here. Um, special drawing rights are a low-hanging fruit, obviously. Now, Dr. Gersh mentioned that Germany did something but could do more. I'd be very interested to know how much Germany actually in percentage converted to overseas development assistance in any way and what would need to change so that the full amount, I think the last round was something like 26 billion. That would be a nice way to fund the pandemic fund, no? What would need to happen that this number, this percentage that we are already converting could improve even more? I thank you very much. That sounds like a question addressed to Christoph. Who wants to go, who wants to take a stab? <laughs> I'm not really not an expert on the SDRs. I mean, it's mentioned as an opportunity, but um, there is talk about converting that, transferring that to also low and middle-income countries, but I'm not an expert on that at all. Sounds like Jayati should have been here. Yes. Wolfram, you want to take a step? No. Okay, fine. Okay. Then actually, I'll, I, a, a, question that is, a question that is very similar, um, we'll move on to the next question. That's fantastic. We'll, 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 we'll come to that later if we get the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, is one that I see here on screen, and that's, that's following, that's addressed to you, Björn, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic sort of question that touches on a number of things, which is what mechanisms, and Pedro asked this, can be used to hold governments accountable for what they do and don't do in global health financing? Okay, um, thanks a lot for the question. Um, for me, the question much depends on um, what we consider global health financing, by the way. Um, I think my, my focus was less on global health financing, but on, on health overall, and, and potentially not even reducing that to global health. But I think um, how I, um, I've seen the global health debates uh, in Geneva, but also elsewhere, they are always driven by consensus. Yeah? Um, so um, we are meeting for two weeks in Geneva, and then we are discussing global health challenges, um, and we never really touch upon the real, who is actually responsible for the health challenges that we are all experiencing on the ground. We are normally focusing on a global responsibility, and we are focusing on what WHO can be doing more, Global Fund, Gavi, potential 
donors could be more. We potentially don't mention them, um, but that's it. Yeah? So there is no, in other policy areas like human rights, you focus on a clear responsibility of domestic governments, what they implement, how they implement human rights, and how they are not implementing human rights. Um, that doesn't exist in global health at this moment. There are specific mechanisms, which you know, um, Pedro, um, uh, which are being discussed in Geneva uh, currently. Um, so there are different evaluations, such as the, uh, there's this idea of a universal health periodic review mechanism that would um, uh, evaluate and assess how a member state, a country, uh, implements specific obligations, uh, let, um, specific uh, obligations when it comes to pandemic preparedness, for example. And one idea um, I think that France was promoting to some extent on uh, how countries implement UHC, universal health coverage. But that's still future discussion. It would be a paradigm shift from my point of view in the global health discussions because it would shift away from this delusion and unclear responsibility to a very clear um, responsibility of one specific member state and then potentially the responsibility of the global community to helping that specific member state in addressing uh, existing gaps. But we are not there yet and it remains to be seen whether we ever get there. With regards to global health financing, um, so how much member states contribute to global public goods, for example, the uh, the finances of WHO or Global Fund and Gavi. I think it's um, also there we are not doing a good job in holding member states to account. And uh, I think uh, Christoph um, clarified that, uh, and I think the, the same is true not only for WHO, but basically for all international global health actors, that they are being funded by a very limited number of donors. WHO, 75% um, of the entire um, finances of WHO are being funded through 10 donors, Germany being one of them. So that's, that's a very limited number which puts the organization at immense risk. And on the other side, it clarifies that the vast majority of countries doesn't contribute, either doesn't contribute at all or below what they are able to contribute. And what we are seeing is that it's been throughout the last, through the, throughout the existence of WHO, 75 years, it's been the same countries again and again and again financing this, these organizations. And I, I'm not arguing against us doing that further, but I'm arguing in favor of others coming in. The world has changed within the last 75 years. And I, at some moment, just did myself an exercise and looked at the list of donors um, with the amount of funding they are contributing to WHO. It's available, it's completely transparent. And I added what I just did this exercise for the BRICS countries because they are very strong and very vocal in WHO. And I added all of them together and wondered which donor would they be all together. This is four or five years ago. They were donor number 28. So this is Russia, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa together. What I'm, I'm, not, what I'm trying to say is here that the emerging economies who are uh, economically completely in, a, in another era compared to 20 years ago, they need to come in. Um, I think that Christoph, in one discussion among the two of us, we discussed the free riders. Yeah? So countries who were participating in debating and shaping, obviously, global health um, politically through announcements, etc. But at this stage, do not do a great job in taking on financial responsibility. And that, I think, needs to change, not only in WHO, but throughout global health. We need to incentivize that, and to some extent, hold them to account politically. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from the floor, definitely. So I'd like to call on our colleague from uh, CEPI, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Uh, lots of different points. One thing I think, um, is coming at investment from with an equity lens. And one question, you know, around the debates at the, the Accord now for pandemic preparedness at the WHO is how much is their commitment and understanding that if you want to protect your national population, you have to think regionally and you have to think globally. And so the investments that, so one thing I think Germany could be thinking about is how do you, because Germany made R&D commitments um, for vaccines and other tools. US did, EU did, the big funders of the G7 did. None of them had 
equitable terms in their R&D and clinical trial commitments. And that's where the equity piece starts. And I think thinking about how do you bring national investments with an equitable lens is, is really important. And then second quick observation, and then my question, which is, you know, global public investment, this idea of trust or lack of trust. None of you mentioned looking at you know, how do we build resilience at national levels? That's the gold star or the north star. That's going to take time. Do we think about regional resilience and how can you incentivize, incentivize that? Um, so question maybe to Christoph on looking at a global public investment, not just at a global level, but could you start building coalitions that have common incentives because they're neighbors or a small group of countries that have small populations that have something in common that would incentivize them to work together at a smaller group level. So you're moving just away from just national, but sort of groupings of countries. And then to Bjorn, um, you know, a, 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 a sort of a non-binding resolution at the high level meetings coming up both for pandemic preparedness and UHC, it is, it is challenging because people at the global commitment level, they're all, comp what would success look like for Germany? What's your ambition in terms of an outcome that you could get behind um, uh, on, on UHC, which is such a big sort of broad concept? Over. Since we're running against time, I, I would propose that uh, maybe Christoph and maybe Wolfram, if you want to sort of take anything of, of what was just said, and then Bjorn, you can have uh, a few words at the end, and then we need to round this off. Christoph. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Samia, for your comments and, and the um, suggestion, I would say. Indeed, we are talking about global public investment, and we should increasingly talk about regional public investment. Um, because all those countries that Bjorn just mentioned, who should provide more, they should provide for global initiatives, but if they would provide resources for regional uh, initiatives that make you know, countries in their regions more resilient and safer, we would also welcome that, of course. The State Secretary mentioned in his speech uh, the initiative that you're supporting from BMZ, you know, vaccine, you know, the research and development and manufacturing in Africa, which is great, you know, supported by the German government. Um, but there are many other regions in the world that also have more, I would say, domestic uh, regional resources than some countries in Africa. We are looking at, you know, South Asia, Southeast Asia, we're looking at Latin America. And if they were starting to kind of bring their resources together, they could probably make a big step forward in financing some of these international, you know, uh, goals, um, becoming more self-sufficient uh, promoting what you know the international community is promoting for example investments in R&D for vaccines for medical countermeasures that was also mentioned including diagnostics and therapeutics and we could much more leverage the resources that these countries have in Asia and Latin America and finally also in Africa and that would provide another way to finance many of these international initiatives. Wolfram. Yes, just two remarks. Uh, one on um, where are we going to in, in, in global health? Um, and if I look at uh, how the climate change um, negotiations went in the last 30 years almost, um, I would say that it is easy to, to, to see that if we if we start from, from thinking that uh, there is a global public good called uh, global health or freedom from infectious diseases at minimum. Maybe it's, it's not all the health issue, but specific parts we consider as global public goods. Then there should be something like international obligations and national obligations on how to, how to deal with the issue. And um, that has happened in climate change. Um, even if obligations are something poorer countries don't want to hear, they, w they always want to start saying that there is a responsibility by the richer countries to support them. So there is the negotiation uh, on, on this topic, uh, how, how, um, what do we expect from each country and what, um, what uh, need is there to support um, poorer countries um, in, in, in their efforts to, to, to progress on, on health. Um, uh, so, um, uh, bluntly, um, there needs to be a high degree of, of, um, 
um, of, of uh, formality, a higher formality, a higher degree of obligations, if you like, uh, uh, natural reporting at least, and, and uh, a process where, where um, this has to be uh, reviewed and improved, and where countries need at least to show what they are doing. Um, that is easy to foresee, but it is not easy to, to get, because we are still in the, in the beginning of all those negotiations, and they... Um, in my, from what I observe, I'm, I'm not the main responsible for this in my ministry, but from what I observe, it, uh, these are difficult negotiations uh, and it will be difficult to, 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 to have results in time and, um, and, and, and also good results. Um, second thing, uh, yes, um, if, if it's a global public good, everybody uh, should participate. That we, we all, it's easy for us to, uh, to agree on this. Um, uh, it's uh, um, uh, difficult to see how this will happen in the short run, um, but I am mildly optimistic because um, maybe the WHO is funded by only a few ones, but uh, I think we have made a major step forward with the funding of the pandemic fund, where some of the non-typical uh, donors now appear, um, like Indonesia, um, China, India, uh, Arab Emirates, uh, now sorry, Arabia is joining. So these are not the usual suspects, so to say, and I, I'm, I'm optimistic that um, they will stick to the pandemic fund and they might even attract others. Um, of course, uh, some are missing. Uh, I mean, where's Brazil, where's Mexico, um, where maybe are some other European member states. Um, so, so there is still a lot of countries who are not participating. But um, again, um, th this, there has been a change from a perspective where donors only were OECD or sometimes only G7 countries and some like Norway and Canada. No, Canada is in G7. But... Um, so, um, so there has been already a change, and I would be optimistic that um, that that this will go on not only in pandemic fund but with the whole issue of um, of financing of global health. Björn, last few short words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, short. Um, so the first note, I didn't on, on the financing part again because um, Wolfram was mentioning this. There are also, from my point of view, good. Good signals, yeah. Um, WHO financing is a good signal. It's interesting to note that um, when we discussed the increase of the assessed contributions, which is the membership fee, uh, it was not the it, it, it normally in, in past um, events uh, when when that was tried to in increase the assessed contributions, it was the U.S., Japan, Germany, and others um, basically uh, against it because obviously the industrial industrialized countries would pay the most. But at this stage. Those countries were, to a large extent, uh, in favor of it from at least midway through, and was a little bit more difficult with, with the emerging economies, Colombia, Mexico, etc. Yeah, and I could go on mentioning them. So there is this resistance from the countries who realize they will have to pay and contribute more. But it was successful in the end because we had a great case and it was possible to, well, call for this investment. And I think that will be possible um, also in other areas. Regionalization, I think also there, um, there's room for optimism. Um, obviously, in the European Union, we have um, uh, a safety net, and the same is being established in the African Union with the CDC. I think there are lots of promising signals that we hear, and, and um, we recognize that. Coming to the final question, when would I consider uh, the UHC um, high-level meeting a success? Well, at this moment, currently, my team is negotiating that uh, resolution together, obviously, with all the other ministries involved. And it's not an easy task because the deadlines are, you, you basically have one and a half hours to go through a 150 pages text. It's impossible. And to some extent, one can question the, this exercise, this overall exercise. Is it possible to provide substantive, um, uh, profound um, feedback on, on specific wording of draft resolutions in such a short time frame, but that's apparently how New York works, uh, and we have to uh, acknowledge that. So, um, when would the UHC high-level meeting be a success to me? From my point of view, it's less important what's being adopted and at the very end in a non-binding uh, resolution. For me, it's more important to really make use of this political momentum that needs to be created on the top leadership 
But that's not sufficient, as I mentioned at upfront. But it's, it's more important to hold those ones who commit, also only politically and not legally, to um, these declarations and resolutions to account on the domestic level. I think that's more essential. So not stopping at the um, UN high-level meeting, and that's not the, the final point, but rather then making use of these declarations and resolutions in the aftermath, which I think we failed to do um, last time. So, um, thanks so much um, to our panelists, to Jayati, um, Christoph, Wolfram, and Björn. Thank you so much. Um, it's all in the policy brief. The next Catalyst Dialogue on Digital Health Data Governance between or convened by the Global Health Hub Germany and Health Developments has already started, so stay tuned, watch this space, more to come. Um, now there will be a coffee break, but make sure you're back at 11.30, both online and in the room, because this will be followed by a TED Talk on new perspectives on climate change and health by Professor Rockstrom, the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. So thanks so much, all of you. Thanks to our panelists, and see you at 11.30.